Kicking off at number five, the Loveland Frogmen. Hailing from the misty swamps and vast wetlands of rural Ohio, the Loveland Frogmen, also effectively known as the Loveland Lizards, are a cryptid unlike no other and have reportedly appeared under several bizarre circumstances on a regular basis in Ohio's Clermont County. Allegedly, the first sightings of these eerie bipedal amphibians first occurred in 1955 and has proven to be one of the most intriguing cryptozoological mysteries in North America. The creatures themselves allegedly live in the temperate forest and wetlands of Clermont County and are able to survive the cold winters of the region without having to hibernate. Useful. During their first sighting at approximately 3.30 a.m., a local businessman was driven down a lonely stretch of road, running alongside the Miami River on the outskirts of the small town known as Loveland, Ohio. Suddenly and out of nowhere, the man claimed to have witnessed three bipedal quasi-reptilian entities emerge from the dense reeds and begin to congregate by the side of the road. The man slowed down and turned out his lights as he pulled his car up to a curb to observe these creatures further. He claimed that they stood between three and four feet tall, were covered with leathery skin and had webbed hands and feet. Their most most distinguishing feature though was their distinctly frog-like head, which the man claimed bore deep wrinkles where their hair should have been. Well, since then, over five more sightings of the Loveland Frogmen have occurred over a 60-year period. What do you guys think? What's going on, Ohio? Next up at number four, the nameless thing of Berkeley Square. And I absolutely love this story either way because if you've ever heard of the famed 50 Berkeley Square in London, England, then you'll know that, cryptid or not, this place is terrifying enough. It's proof as well that there are some cases out there which irk on the realm of the paranormal and become a category so unexplainable that they don't really fit into anything or can fit into anything. I don't know, it's pretty nebulous. Either way though, the haunted legacy of Berkeley Square has featured ghosts and poltergeists the world over and it's widely considered to be one of the most haunted places in England. But there is one particular instance that takes the cake, the nameless thing of Berkeley Square. A tale that takes place in 1840 when a 20-year-old Sir Robert Walboys got into a drunken dare in which he had written off Berkeley Square and its paranormal reputation as a whole load of Kaiser Soze. He put money down that he could spend the night in the building's most cursed and haunted second floor and so the next evening did exactly that, with a pistol in his hand for robbers. I guess, and a makeshift pulley line attached to a bell in case he saw anything out of the ordinary. He drank a whole load of courage and tried to get some shut eye, but well of course, young Bobby Warboy's story cuts out there, when the landlord was awoken by the bell rig ringing incessantly and ran upstairs to check on him. He found Robert Warboy's dead as a doornail slouched in the corner with his eyes bulging in terror. Legend has it that the landlord witnessed an amorphous shadowy form with slime oozing from it, claws and tentacles and all dripping from its form, suddenly slink back into the shadows of the corner corner of the room and disappear. And since then, tales of the nameless thing of Berkeley Square are more common than any of us would actually like. Swinging in at number three, the Kinderhook Blob which is just a great name, really, isn't it? And if I'm being honest, the legend of the Kinderhook Blob is exactly what cryptid tales are made of, so strap in. It's sometime in 1962 New York, and on six separate occasions, multiple witnesses encountered a floating, mysterious blob-like creature that was so terrifying in its form that two men armed with shotguns fled in terror. The initial encounter was from a 10-year-old boy named Hallenbeck and his seven-year-old cousin, Chari. They were playing in the dense woods nearby the house when all of a sudden they both heard this really high-pitched whistle noise and suddenly from behind a nearby pine tree they witnessed a white amorphous object appear in full view which slowly began writhing toward them. On five more occasions which insanely would happen over the next 12 years all the way until 1978 dozens of eyewitnesses would explain in vivid detail similar accounts of an amorphous white blob like creature that would emerge from the woods often attaching its tendrils to trees whilst incessantly making its way towards its victims causing them to flee in terror. So much so that on one occasion occasion, two grown men tried blowing it to pieces with shotguns to no avail and then turned tail and ran. What I love about this story is the essence of a cryptid tale. For all intents and purposes, the Kinderhook Blob could be a disused weather balloon floating listlessly through the air, but because it was seen multiple times by multiple people in the right setting, the legend of the terrifying white blob quickly became a horrifying reality. Either that or it's a sentient alien life form that's going to consume us all. So. Yeah. Coming in next at number two, the disappearance of Peter Grayson. The Groot slang or the Groat slang, which in Afrikaans loosely translates to big snake, is a legendary creature widely considered to be one of the continent's most prolific cryptids and is reputed to dwell exclusively in the deep caves and cavernous systems in the Richesfeld, South Africa. According to legend, the Groot slang is a primordial creature that is reputedly as old as the world itself and dwells within what locals refer to as the bottomless pit, which also, conveniently enough, is also filled with precious diamonds. 
diamonds. Well, diamonds historically have a proficiency of attracting daring adventurers, and one of those adventurers just so happened to be an English businessman known as Peter Grayson. In 1917, Grayson and a team of excavators began an expedition into the Richesville Cave System, accompanied by several local guides. After heading out into the rocky desert landscape, and upon hearing that Grayson intended to descend into the bottomless pit, unwittingly the lair of the group slang, the local guides quickly left after warning Grayson that they'd lost friends and family to the violent serpent before, and they weren't going to do it again. He shrugged it off, and alongside his two excavators, headed deep into the cave, and well, that's the last that they heard of any of them. The Grayson dynasty faded into obscurity after their patriarch was never seen alive again, but as the legend goes, one of the local guides returned to the cave a day or so later after feeling guilty for abandoning Grayson and his team. At the entrance of the cave, he found the body of an excavator, half of his body, actually, to be specific. His legs and most of his torso had been ripped clean off, and he died attempting to crawl back out. What a way to go. And finally, coming in at our number one spot, the legend of Yuri Grando. And I just have to tell this cryptid story because it's one of my favorites, and it's also considered to be one of the first historical instances of vampirism. As the legend goes, Yuri Grando Aljevic was a villager and poor peasant from the region of Istria, which now makes up modern day Croatia. Historically, he was referred to as a strigoi, strigon or strigun, a local word for something that resembles a vampire and a warlock. Sometime around 1656, Yuri died due to an unknown illness, but according to legend, he regularly returned from the grave at night as a vampire to terrorize his village until his decapitation in 1672. The legend tells that for 16 years after his death, Europe would rise from his grave by night and terrorize the village. The village priest, Giorgio, who had buried Euro 16 years previously, discovered that at night, somebody would knock on the doors around the village, and on whichever door he knocked, someone from that house would die within the next few days. Eventually, the villagers rallied after witnesses saw the corpse of Europe roaming the streets, and led by the town's mayor, chased and tried to kill him with a hawthorn stick, but failed to pierce his supernatural flesh. The next night, nine people went to the graveyard and dug up Yuri's coffin, finding a perfectly preserved corpse with a smile on its face. It was Yura with pristine white flesh and no signs of decomposition. They tried to stake him once more, but witnesses noted that the stick would not penetrate its flesh. Eventually, the villagers were so terrified and kind of fed up with his vampire antics that a brave villager known as Stepan Milosic took a saw and decapitated the corpse. As soon as it tore Yura's skin, the vampire screamed and blood began gushing from the cut. Allegedly, a man that was presumed dead for 16 years. Yeah. Kicking off at number five, the Silver Woman. And this story comes from a police motorway patrol woman from Portsmouth, England, who explains that her career regularly confronts her with situations that are both bizarre and unnerving. But this one kind of takes the cake. On the 25th of November, around 6.30 p.m., during a routine speed camera set up in the Portsmouth city center, her speed trap began picking up random tracings of non-existent objects in pitch black darkness, hurtling past her vehicle at around 30 to 40 40 miles per hour. Now, I know what you might be thinking, the device was obviously malfunctioning, but that wasn't the case, and our police officer had already thought of that. She trained the camera manually back onto the road surface to see what had been picked up, and she was shocked to discover that on the screen was what could only be described as humanoid figures running up and down the street at about 40 feet ahead of the vehicle. Strangely enough, they seemed to have a silver appearance to them, almost shimmering and translucent. She looked out of the window, and again, nothing was there, but when she looked back at the screen, about 10 feet away from the vehicle was one of the same silvery entities standing motionless facing away from the van hulking and breathing in a strange fashion as if they were weighing up taking on the police officer what were they well we'll never know and when she played the tape back for her fellow officers the silvery entities were nowhere to be seen yeah i've got no clue about this one coming in at number four the folk monster now, Bigfoot is obviously the heavy hitter of the cryptid world. People have devoted their entire lives to hunting down the elusive mountain creature, stretching all the way across the wildlands of North America, as well as similar instances across the planet. But there is one little town in America that seems to be the hotspot for these sightings, Folk, Arkansas. And in 1971, it became the scene of its most terrifying legend. Meet Bobby Ford, a man who vehemently claims he's seen Bigfoot, or a version of it, describing it as seven feet tall, ridiculously fast, and covered in long brown hair. And he saw it 
up close and personal. It was a Saturday when Bobby and his brother were out hunting a short distance from their rural home when they heard screams in the distance. Bobby's wife, Elizabeth Ford, was frozen in horror when a creature reached through the front window, massive and hairy with glowing red eyes that made no sound except for heavy breathing. When Bobby and his brother ran back to the home, the creature turned and grabbed him as he sprinted up to the porch. It tackled him to the ground with ease and then disappeared into the woodland. The creature had left behind clear tracks in the house and nearby area, three toed footprints that matched the deep three fingered scratches that were made in the wood of the front porch. Bobby Ford was rushed to hospital and treated for minor wounds and shock and the family were so terrified by the encounter that they moved out. They would only lived there a week. It's terrible timing. Next up at number three, the grey man of Ben McDewey. Ben McDewey in Gaelic Mountain of the Son of Duff is an awe-inspiring peak of the Scottish Highlands, staking the claim as one of Britain's highest mountains and the highest of the Cairngorms National Park. It's been scaled by countless people throughout history, but there are those that claim that there's something more sinister living out on the mountain. The Grey Man of Ben McDewey. And it doesn't like visitors. The creature is said to be at least 20 feet tall, and one eyewitness of the creature's presence, a respected professor and mountain climber named Norman Colley, said that he was first aware of something following him during his ascent after hearing strange footsteps behind him. Alone, isolated on the mountain, something was following him and it wasn't human. The footsteps were laborious and delayed as if that whatever was following him was much, much taller than he was. When he saw it, he described the grey man as vaguely human shaped, brown in hue and fur, and shrouded in a strange grey mist. In 1945, a similar thing happened to a renowned mountain climber named Peter Densham, who described the exact same encounter with the exact same creature. Again, in 1958, the Scots magazine wrote of a similar account from naturalist Alexander Tunion, who who this time found himself armed with a rifle and fired several rounds into the grey man. He thought he'd hit it, whatever it was, but after trekking over through the snow, found no sign of the creature. It vanished away like fog rolling across a mountain, and the mystery of the grey man of Ben McDewey remains unsolved. Swinging in at number two, the Cabbage Town Tunnel Monster, which is an urban legend from my current stomping grounds of Toronto, Ontario, that is grounded in such bizarre circumstances that remains a warning not to go wandering through the dark tunnels of downtown Toronto. I'm talking about the path, ever. Don't go there. In 1978, in the Eastern Cabbage Town district of Toronto, a 51 year old man known as Ernest had a terrifying encounter in the network of tunnels that sprawl beneath the city. He had been out searching the neighborhood for a missing kitten that him and his wife had been raising when he stumbled across a tunnel entrance and decided to explore. After venturing 10 feet into the gloom, Ernest suddenly came across a creature that looked somewhat like a long, thin monkey, around three feet in height, with large teeth and covered in grey fur. It had unsettling eyes, he described, that peered out of the darkness in a bright orange hue. Even more unsettling, Ernest claimed that the creature spoke to him. Go away, go away, it said in a hissing voice before slinking down a tunnel off onto the side. Ernest was reluctant to come forward with his story. He was a respected member of the community and he feared that he'd be ridiculed by his peers. But after being convinced by a friend, he spoke to the Toronto Sun and a group of journalists and investigators followed him into the same tunnel. Although they didn't see the creature, they did see that the narrow tunnel led to a strange gloomy chasm that dropped into the unseen sewer system below. And even stranger, they found the maimed, half-eaten carcass of a cat buried loosely beneath the dirt and debris. It permeated the legend of the Cabbage Town Tunnel Monster and whatever it was, we may never know for sure. Just stay away. Number five, Kamataichi. I love doing videos and lists like these ones because I get to spend a lot of time researching into these different cultures and cryptids I never really would have known about without these opportunities. So thanks for watching stuff like this so I can keep on doing them. That's my greedy reason behind it. I just like learning. Our first cryptid from the land of the rising sun is going to be the Kamataichi. This yokai appears as a weasel with razor sharp sickle like claws. If you're a Pokemon head, big Pokemon fan, a Sneasel from second gen, the dark ice type, he's based on a Kamataichi. They've got spiny fur, similar to a hedgehog, and they bark like a dog, and they have razor sharp claws. These adorable funny little guys are extremely lightweight, lighter than the wind itself even, and as such, 
travel by gusts of wind soaring through the sky like they're radical furry little windsurfers. Legends of the Kamataichi first came about in the Chubu region of Japan, notorious for its icy sharp winds that were so powerful they would blow men over. These legends then took the form of the Kamataichi. The winds literally personified as this little vermin miscreant. It attacks you in the legs and it knocks you over. You're all exposed and helpless while it picks away at your vitals with its little sickle hands. These creatures are surgical when they strike. A Kamataichi sucks away and feeds on any of the gore left behind by their wounds. These creatures are said to be totally stealthy, impossible to see with the naked eye and blend into their surroundings well. And here's some, some pedantic little wordplay trivia. I know all the kids at home love pedantic wordplay trivia. There's some debate as to whether or not Kamataichi's name is nothing more than a cheesy pun. There's a stance that old sword fighters in Japan would use called Kamataichi, translating loosely to sword stance. And well, you can see if you just literally squish those two sounds together. And if you're looking for way more cryptid content, creepy tales, true stories, fake stories, aliens, conspiracies, horror movies, and basically just about everything weird and freaky that could possibly happen on this world, Top 5 Scary is the place to be. So hit subscribe, ring that bell when you do, and stay scared. But also stay watching this video, okay? Nothing I love more than seeing you guys watch them all the way to the end. Now let's keep going. Number four, Teke Teke. Coming in next is gonna be a fairly newer urban legend, but it gripped me so much I had to include it in this. It's the Teke Teke. Teke Teke is a legend about the ghost of a student who was slain when she fell onto a railway line where she was then split in half by a train. No easy way to say that. Might as well just get it out of the way. Much like an Onryo, which hold on to that thought for now. We're gonna come back to that in a minute. She's a vengeful spirit of a wronged woman who lurks train stations at night stalking out for her victims. She drags herself across the ground using her arms, dragging the spine sticking out of her torso, scraping across the ground, making a horrifying ticket ticket ticka 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 sound from where she gets her name. And you thought that was just like a cute little sounding name, didn't you? Nope. Try if you can. Just try to get the mental image out of your head of a ghost girl clawing along on just her hands and elbows and her spine following along behind her. She's also carrying a giant sickle with her, so there's that too. She's really not much of a farmer, so I'll tell you right now, she's not using that for crops. If she finds you, Teke Teke will chase you and slice you in half. Whoops. <laughs> Some variations say that she only takes your legs, which I guess is better, but really not by much. There's a specific variation of the legend that gives Teke Teke a bit more backstory for her origin, saying her name is Kashima Raiko, and she's a specific entity. She died when her legs were severed from her body, and the next part gets a bit creepy, so you might want to grab onto something. Maybe put a little salt circle around your computer. It's said that when an individual learns of Kashima's story, she'll appear to you within the next month. Uh, so start timing now, I guess. Kashima Raiko is said to haunt bathroom stalls asking where her legs have gone. If you answer in a way she doesn't approve of, she'll um, take them from you. Incredibly bizarrely, most of all, this isn't the only bathroom themed horror story on this list and I'm not joking, so we'll talk about that in a minute, but in the meantime, sit tight and wait what I could possibly mean. Number three, Kamakiri. Something I really like about reading about Japanese yokai and their mythological monsters when you read about a bunch of them is that they tend to kind of fall into two categories, you know? It's either the most terrifying thing I have ever heard in my life. A story of a malevolent spirit that's been wronged and will haunt you and do something unspeakable for a painful death, or they're just like weird little goblins or like weird little ghouls that go around doing silly little things. The Kamakiri is one of the silliest little demons I have ever read about, so that's why I'm including them because they're hilarious. A Kamakiri looks like a weird little bird, like a little bird monster, with a razor sharp beak and very pointed claws. They're teeny, teeny, teeny tiny and very sneaky to move under detected. So what does the dreaded Kamakiri do? Are you ready for this? Hold on to something because this is going to terrify you. It breaks into your house at night and it cuts your hair. They hide in your roof and they wait at night for the perfect moment to strike and then they go in and they just mess up your perfect dew. They layer it all weird. They cut the ends right off. They frost your tips and they go after anyone. Okay? They're not picky. If you've got a head of hair, they want to snip it up. Only the baldies are safe now. They wait until you're asleep and if you're wondering, you're just sitting there like why would anyone tell a story about this monster? Why would anyone make this up? It was in periods of Japanese history when long hair was really the only fashion and accepted hairstyle, I would have done great. So the idea 
idea of a nobleman having his hair cut in the middle of the night was like spine chilling. These days though, it just makes Kamakiri sound like he's like a college prankster than it does a real monster. But that's only half of why I thought this creature was so, so, so funny. Aside from the split end touch ups, a Kamakiri cutting your hair is said to be a sign that the victim is about to unknowingly marry a yokai. Shapeshifters like Yorigumo or Kitsune can trick young men into marriage. So the Kamakiri steps in and he cuts your hair to let you know uh, you might accidentally end up marrying a demon spider shapeshifter woman. And I just got paid to say that sentence out loud. We made it, Ma. Kamakiri, you might win the top five scary award for one of the funniest cryptids we've ever talked about on the channel. A solid number two compared to my true favorite, Akaname, the demon that comes into your bathroom and eats waste, which I guess would make him number two. That's the rudest joke I'll ever tell on this channel. I'm so sorry. You guys can cut that if you want. <laughs> okay, moving on. Number two, Akamanto. The Akamanto, also known as the Red Cloak, is a masked spirit and may very well be one of the most evil, weird creatures I've ever heard described in folklore, so just wait till you get a load of this. Now, like any good folktale, there are some local variations in how Akamanto operates, but the elements that remain consistent across all tales are that the Akamanto preys on you during your most personal moments. You know, he tends to come for kings who sit on a porcelain throne. He visits you in the smallest room in the house. He uh, catches you with your pants down. This demon comes for you when you're on the toilet, if that isn't quite getting across yet. I didn't know how to just say it. The Akamanto then offers you a deadly choice, pulls a little matrix on you, and it asks you to choose between red toilet paper or blue toilet paper. Kind of like that one scene from Squid Games with the guy offering the paper. Actually, a little funny trivia, the creator of Squid Games confirmed this monster is what inspired that scene. So a little symbolism about that you didn't know about before and now you do. Now it's all a trick question, of course. Neither of the toilet papers this ghastly spirit has for you are anything like the Royale kittens. The red paper means you'll find yourself all cut up, leaving behind quite a mess. And the blue option means you'll be left gasping for air, clean, but slow and painful. The only way to escape the Akamanto's dreaded game is to tell him you've got enough, actually, and thanks for asking, but you're good. No, really, you, you just have to ignore him. <laughs> Tell him, <laughs> tell him you're good, or flush quick and hightail it out of there. You know, don't play it smart with him. Don't ask him for purple. Don't ask him for sandpaper. No wise guy answers. He's a, he's a toilet paper demon. He doesn't want to hear any of that. It's said that if you mess with him, you mess with the Akamanto, he drags you feast first into the underworld. At least he doesn't flush you. Why did they make that? Why did the backstory behind the toilet paper demon? I do not know. Okay, number one, Onryo. And our number one, I went with the Onryo. And Onryo translates almost literally to a vengeful spirit. And in every definition of the the words, that statement rings true. They're also sometimes called hatred spirits because an Onryo is specifically a ghost of someone who is capable of causing grievous harm to the living. Onryo are almost always depicted as women who were wronged in their life. They're not exclusively women, but majority of them are. And they were traumatized by their death and they spend the rest of their days exacting revenge. God forbid women do anything fun, huh? Nailing down exactly what an Onryo is capable of is difficult because there are so many countless interpretations of the vengeful spirit, but just know at home that nothing good ever comes out of crossing an Onryo. You can expect things like sleep paralysis, telekinesis, curses, evil magic, like I said, really nothing good. It's worth noting that as part of the legend of an Onryo, her vengeance can never be satisfied, no matter how many enemies she fells in her wake. An Onryo will go after her lovers, family, whoever she had the most lingering pain for. And after she's done with that, well, she'll just attack indiscriminately. You gotta do something with the day, right? Onryo are a very traditional Japanese story, popping up in a lot of performance art pieces like uh, No, Kabuki, and Rakugo, and they even continue to be the center stage in modern works. Probably the most famous Onryo I think most Westerners would know about is Sadako Yamamura from The Ring, otherwise known as Samura if you only saw the American version, and if you have, you gotta fix that at some point for me, okay? And Onryo traditionally is described as wearing a white barrio kimono, she's got wild unkempt long black hair obscuring her face, and in stage plays with dramatic white and blue paint. So just, she looks like the girl from the ring, basically. And how does one stop an Onryo? Oh, you don't. Yeah, there's nothing. Once she's coming for you, she's coming for you. So, um, you know, be nice. Just be nice to the ladies in your life and hope that they never come back as vengeful revenge spirits. Number five, the Fresno Nightcrawlers. Starting off the list is gonna be my favorite cryptids in the whole wide world, the Fresno Nightcrawler. If you've never seen footage of them, it's gonna change your life. Look at them. Look at the way they stride around like a pair of pants that came to life. These things are the absolute perfect cryptid to me. There's never been a story of them hurting anything or anyone. There's no livestock that goes missing when the nightcrawlers are around. It's just some chill dudes going for a late night stroll. I can really get down with the lifestyle that the Fresno Nightcrawlers are about. The nightcrawlers were first spotted 
spotted in Fresno, California, which makes a lot of sense why they're called that. They've been mostly spotted in California almost exclusively a couple times, save for one reported sighting in Poland. So must have been a pretty long walk they were going on. The first recorded sighting was by a man in Fresno named Jose, who claimed that during the night he heard his dogs freaking out at something outside. He went to go see what his dogs were making so much noise about, and through a security camera system in his home, he saw the two little crawlers making their way around. He woke up his brother to come watch the footage as well, but by the time he'd awoken, the creature was already gone. The next morning, they called in investigators to inspect the lawn and the footage, but there was absolutely no trace of anything. No footprints, no spots, nothing. All they had was grainy CCTV footage of the night crawlers making their way down the lawn. Since their sighting, there's been endless debate as to just what the night crawlers are. Some suspect spirits or ghosts, because they do look kind of spectral in the video, but a number of people have also put forward the idea that the night crawlers could be visitors from another world. They don't look like anything on this planet, so maybe they came down. Who's to say? The only person who can truly decide is you. And hey, if you want to see loads more videos of things what might be cryptids or what might be aliens, then you already know the vibe. It's Top 5 Scary. We got more videos of cryptids and aliens that you could ever watch, but you're welcome to try. Stay subscribed and don't miss a scream. Number 4. The Enfield Horror The Enfield Horror is a pretty notable cryptid in American history, and it gets its name from a small string of sightings when it terrorized the town of Enfield, Illinois. The creature has been described as a small, goblin-esque being. Oh, you know how I feel about goblins. It doesn't really resemble any living animals on this planet that it could very easily be described as. It's reported as having three legs and leathery skin and moving in a vaguely monkey-esque way compared to a baboon hopping around. So the first time the Enfield Horror was ever spotted, it was in 1973 by one Henry McDaniel. He and his wife had been out that night and were returning home and were greeted by their children. The kids had told their father that there was something they'd seen outside that was trying to get inside the house by scratching on the door. Mr. McDaniel initially assumed it was probably just a cat or a dog, but later on during the night, that peculiar scratching came back again at the front door. He went out to shoo the animal away and was shocked at what he saw. He described to police that it had three legs on it, a short body, two little short arms, and two pink eyes as big as flashlights. It stood four and a half feet tall and was grayish colored, and it was trying to get into their house. McDaniel saw this weird little thing and thought best to rid the world of it and fired at it. He claims he struck the creature, telling police that, when I fired that first shot, I know I hit. He says the creature hissed at him, claiming that it sounded like a wildcat hissing, and then proceeded to bound away in long leaps across the yard. The next day, police were alerted to the story and sent over to investigate the yard as to what happened. They didn't find much, but they did find three-footed tracks throughout the yard. So just what on earth was the Enfield Horror? Or is that the operative word? Was it of this earth? Could it have been some animal that had lost a leg and was injured limping around? Or is it something that had slipped out of an enclosure from a UFO and was hopping around our planet looking for a new meal? Coming in at number three is the Chupacabra, one of the most famous cryptids maybe ever in urban folklore. For those somehow not in the know, the Chupacabra is often thought to be a canid-like monster and is purportedly responsible for disappearances of livestock, predominantly throughout Mexico and the American Southwest, but also propping up in places like Puerto Rico. You know what Chupacabra has been around whenever you find that your livestock has either gone missing or is found dead with all its blood sucked right out. This is actually where the name comes from. While most depictions of the Chupacabra almost always define it as being a coyote-like creature, albeit a twisted, mangled looking one, usually described as a totally hairless dog with beady black eyes and a sleek figure. There are some stories and sightings of chupacabras that describe it as being more like a demon or an alien. Describing it as being a humanoid creature, often reptilian in nature, walking around on two legs and feeding on livestock. In all the years since chupacabras have first been reported, though there are countless, countless sightings, there's never been a fully recovered one that we couldn't explain. Everything that's been found by hunters always ends up turning out to be dogs with mange, being misattributed to being the cryptid. So maybe, is it possible that there's been a giant mix-up? And all the sightings of chupacabras that report them as canines are just that, just sick dogs that get mistaken for looking something weird, and that the real chupacabra is the reptilian, more bipedal sightings that get reported. It could explain why there's never been one recovered, and why livestock keeps going missing under bizarre circumstances. It's even possible that the drained livestock could be creatures that have been recovered to study, abducted under bizarre experiments. Could chupacabras themselves be in a bizarre experiment that's been unleashed into our world? A hybrid chimera breed that was created by alien life and let loose on us to run havoc on us? 
Number two, the Dover Demon. The Dover Demon looks outright like an alien, maybe more so than anything else on this list. Its description describes it as a pale, naked, leathery creature with a giant watermelon-esque head and no discernible facial features outside of two gigantic eyes. Kind of looks like Roger from American Dad. It looks like the exact depiction of a little gray man. The first ever sighting of the Dover Demon was in 1977 in the small town of Dover, Massachusetts. One Bill Bartlett was driving down the road with his friends late at night until they saw something bizarre creeping along a low wall of loose stones on the side of the road. Initially, Bartlett assumed that it was just a cat, one of the most often mistaken creatures for cryptids. But as the headlights shone on it, he realized it wasn't like anything he had ever seen. The creature slowly looked up to stare at him, and he described it as having peach-colored skin with a rough texture akin to sandpaper. Not long after initially seeing the Dover Demon, it disappeared almost into thin air. The creature vanished. It's been wondered, actually, by cryptozoologists after this sighting if perhaps the creature had some sort of camouflage ability or some sort of transportation ability even. Given the extreme resemblance to Little Greys, the alien most commonly described as being the ones responsible for most abductions, could it be possible that the Dover Demon was something scouting out, a creature looking out from above the stars? Could that possibly explain why the creature was able to vanish so quickly? Was it just a remarkably sneaky little fella? Or is it possible that it was technologically advanced in some way or being backed up by someone else who beamed it on back to whatever ship it came from? And finally, at our number one spot is the Flatwoods Monster, a creature that has long since thought to be alien in origin, and not a cryptid as some have said. The Flatwoods Monster was first sighted in West Virginia because of course it was. Everything creepy is in West Virginia. West Virginia is nothing but beautiful, the most picturesque mountains you've ever seen in your life, and horrifying monsters all the way down. John Denver forgot to tell you that part in his songs. The Flatwood Monster was described as being 10 feet tall and roughly 4 feet wide. It's described as being more mechanical in nature than it is organic. Kind of a Darth Vader deal going on. Its most notable feature is its giant head with two gigantic glowing eyes described as either bright red or bright green depending on who's telling the story. And it's got a giant cowl in the shape of a spade behind this big orb making it look like a big weird alien vampire. Its body was armored with thick vertical pipes and it's got spindly little arms. The first ever sighting of the Flatwood Monster was in the 50s, 1952 to be specific. Three boys saw something flailing out of the sky, hitting the ground nearby. The boys went home and one of them told their mother that they thought they'd seen something fall from the sky, maybe an asteroid, and they wanted some help to go check it out. Always a good idea to ask permission from your mom first if you're going to go check out an alien. Stranger Things kids would have saved themselves so much trouble if they did that. They gathered a small search party together, you know, just in case, and the group gathered and sought out the farm where the object landed, and eventually made their way to the top of the hill, where they saw a large ball of fire and reported smelling some mist that was making their eyes burn. A person in the search party then noticed that there were two bright glowing green eyes that were floating around in the trees, and he flashed his light to unveil what was hiding in the dark. They were then treated to a full view of the Flatwood Monster in all of its horror. The creature then hissed at them and flew upwards into the night never to be seen again. Now over the years, detractors have claimed that the Flatwood Monster could just have been the darkness playing tricks on people's eyes, and that it could have been just a barn owl obscured by shadow. I definitely kind of see that. I see a similar enough face shape. Barn owls are kind of weird looking, but I feel like the size would be hard to misunderstand. Plus, that doesn't really explain off the mist that was making everyone's eyes burn, or the strange thing that fell from the sky. If you ask me, there's a lot more to say the Flatwood Monster is an alien than there is to say it's an owl. Coming in at number four, we have Yowie. Yowie, also known as Yehu, Yori, Hairy Man, or Yahoo, is a fanged humanoid creature or great ape featured in Aboriginal mythology along with Australian raptors or Burringer. It is considered to be the Australian Bigfoot and contains many primate-like features, indicating that it is an undiscovered species of great ape. Yowie is described as being one of the most aggressive Sasquatch species and has been reported ripping the heads off of kangaroos and dogs. In the past, it has been described to be around seven to nine feet tall with a large red mouth and talon-like claws, according to Aboriginal legends. It is also noted as having two large fang-like canines, which distinguish the Yowie from the other Bigfoot species. There are around 140 placental mammals known to exist in Australia, most belonging to the order Chiroptera and Rodentia. Some cryptozoologists theorize that the Yowie could be some form of bipedal marsupial, such as a descendant of the New Guinea Hulotherium. Coming in at number three, we have Mongolian Deathworm. The Mongolian death 
worm, also known as its native name, or goi korokoi, meaning intestine worm, due to its red blood-like color and size, which is the size of an intestine. It has often been described as around two to seven feet long and possesses the ability to spit out a corrosive yellow saliva and generate blasts of electricity. Mongolian nomads believe the giant worm covers its prey with an acidic substance that turns everything a corroded yellow color. Legend has it that as a creature begins to attack, it raises half of its body out of the sand and starts to inflate until it explodes, releasing the lethal poison all over the victim. It is said that the livestock and humans are its main prey, and because Mongolia had been under Soviet control until 1990, there is very little known about the cryptid. Nobody is entirely sure what the worm actually is, with some experts claiming it to be fake, due to the Gobi Desert being too hot an area for annelids to survive. Some have suggested it might be a skink, but they are said to have little legs and scaly skin, whereas witness accounts have specified that the worm is limbless and smooth-bodied. In 2005, an expedition from the Center for Fortean Zoology crossed the thousand miles of the Gobi on the track of the death worm. They concluded it was likely a large, unknown type of worm lizard, and the powers that were attributed to it were apocryphal. Coming in at number two, we have Ahul. The Ahul, or the Athol, is a winged cryptid often portrayed as a giant bat or even a flying primate, depending on the variation. Tales tell of it living in the deepest parts of the jungle of Java and can be found across most of Indonesia. Subspecies can be found on the neighboring islands of New Guinea in the form of the Ropen, a presumed cousin to the Ahul. The Ropen aptly translates to demon flying and is also said to be a big bat, or more commonly a pterosaur. It is said to produce a light, possibly to attract fish. The Ropen is said to have a long snout, large wings, and a long thin crest. It has a distinct face that has features of both a chimpanzee's and a bat's large dark eyes, red skinned wings, large claws on its forearms and is covered in grey fur. It is also noted as having a wingspan of 18 to 28 feet and is said to be the largest bat known to mankind. Now back to the Ahuls, they are said to be covered in a thick brown or black fur much like fruit bats, but unlike bats have a long powerful legs and claws and are supposedly capable of pouncing on and snatching up living prey, including humans. Sightings of these winged beasts are often dismissed simply as mistaken glimpses of owls, eagles and other large birds of prey that inhabit the rainforests. However, many sources can confirm that the beast does in fact exist and may even be an isolated and undiscovered species. And finally, coming in at number one, we have Black Shuck. Black Shuck, or Old Shuck, or simply Shuck, is the name given to an unknown creature which is said to roam in East Anglia. It is one of the many ghostly black dogs recorded across the British Isles. The Black Shuck is often recorded as an omen of death and some occasions a more companionable animal. Although it is classified as a cryptid, there have been various sightings and reports of the animal's appearance throughout the United Kingdom. For centuries throughout England, many have told tales of large black dogs, with malevolent flaming eyes are often depicted as red or sometimes green. According to reports, the beast varies in size and stature from that of simply a large dog to being the size of a calf or even a horse. Other accounts report that black shuck as floating on a carpet of mist or even appearing headless. According to folklore, the shuck haunts East Anglia, primarily coastline, graveyard, side roads, body of water, and dark forest. W.A. Dutt, in his 1901 Highways and Byways in East Anglia, describes the creature, I quote, He takes the form of a huge black dog and prowls along the dark lanes and lonesome field footpaths where, although his howling makes the hearer's blood run cold, his footfalls make no sound. You may know him at once, should you see him, by his fiery eye. He has but one, and like the Cyclops, is in the middle of his head but such an encounter might bring you the worst of luck. It is even said that to meet him is to be warned that your death will occur before the end of the year. As I stated before, the Black Shuck has been reported many times, with one of the most notable reports being the appearance at the churches of Bungay and Blyberg in Suffolk. On August 4th, 1957, Black Shuck was said to have burst in through the church doors to a clap of thunder. He ran up to the nave, past a large congregation, killing a man and a boy and causing the church steeple to collapse through the roof. As the dog left, he left scorch marks on the door, which can be seen at the church even to this day. Number five, the Dover Demon. Starting off on our list, is the cutest cryptid on this list in my opinion, but still a creepy little freak. I like to start with the cute ones to kind of ease you into it. The Dover Demon first appeared in Massachusetts in the town of Dover, lending it its name. It appears as a spindly little demon kind of looking thing that sort of resembles a little gray, the traditional big-eyed aliens that you see everywhere. The Dover Demon is identified by its black 
blank face, its red glowing eyes, and its hunched quadruped stature. The Dover Demon was first recorded in the late 1970s, discovered by three teenagers who were driving through Mass when they saw something bizarre being lit up by their headlights. Initially, they didn't think too much of it, until they noticed that the creature in front of them looked more like a human than it did an animal. The driver, one Bill Bartlett, described the creature as resembling a baby with elongated arms, tan, sandpaper-like skin, which was coarse looking, and no nose, ears, or mouth to speak of on its bulbous, enlarged head. Bartlett claims that he only got a good look at it for a few seconds before it vanished off into the night. Now, there are some who speculate that the Dover Demon is capable of rendering itself invisible or camouflaging itself because of the description of this story, and that during daylight, it prefers to hide itself in the trees of Dover. Now, bizarrely, I think, some skeptics write off the Dover Demon by claiming it was just a baby moose being seen at an odd angle or under strange conditions. And I don't know if I really buy that. I've never seen a baby moose at night in headlights, but I have seen a baby moose. They would have a bulbous head or front-facing eyes, and a baby moose doesn't have that, so I don't know if it's all that. A more pressing question, I think, is if the Dover Demon is a cryptid or perhaps a visitor from another planet, because it does look a lot like the descriptions of the Little Grays. Now there's a bigger philosophical question there. Are aliens cryptid? Let me know about that in the comments below. And if you like hearing stories about cryptids and aliens, well, I have some great news, my friend. We got loads of cryptid videos on the channel, so get comfy, click through the playlists, and stay subscribed for something new every day. Number three, Qualpalic. The Qualapalic, or the Qualapiluit, is an indigenous cryptid, with most stories emanating from Nunavut, Canada, and Alaska in the United States. The Qualapalak is described as appearing vaguely humanoid, but having scaly and bumpy skin, and long, stringy, disgusting black hair. They are described as being disgustingly ugly, and that they reek of sulfur. And I think it's worth noting that you cannot find a single artist's depiction of these things that don't make them just look, like, vomitatiously gross. Interestingly, the creature is predominantly described as being a female monster, although some local variations of the stories exist where it is described as a male creature, but most tales revolving it describe it as a lady monster. The Gualapalic is a bit of an icy boogeyman, snatching up children who misbehave, waiting around thin ice to crack up and drag those children down into freezing cold water. It's thought that the origin of this creature was first told as a story for practical purposes, as a pretty good way to get kids to not walk on thin ice is to tell them that they'll be grabbed by a gross ice demon. Allegedly, when they grab a child, they stuff them inside their leather burlap sacks, then scurry back downwards into the water. It's said that you can hear a knocking under the ice as a last warning that they're about to strike. Now maybe this is just a personal experience I had, and maybe some of you also had this as a little kid, but I was read a children's book called A Promise is a Promise, a Robert Munch classic, that featured a Qualapalic as a villain that was trying to get a little girl to bring her younger siblings to the Qualapalic as a little snack, and it terrified me so much. I didn't even live anywhere near thin ice, and I was scared about it. it scared me bad. Wiry black hair and sunken little eyes got me. Maybe it's not relatable at all, but but I thought I would share that. I definitely didn't spend any time near thin ice afterwards. Number two, the Jersey Devil. The Jersey Devil is a fairly popular cryptid and has been subject to all sorts of sightings and stories since the early 1700s. And I bet you can't guess where it usually shows up. That's right, California. Nope, New Jersey. The Jersey Devil is commonly described as manifesting itself as a chimeric creature with a horse's head, bat wings, a snake-like tail, and hooves. There's an interesting folk tale that says that the Jersey Devil was brought into our world when a woman was stressed out over her 13th pregnancy. Good lord, yeah, I would be too at my 13th pregnancy. Okay. <laughs> she was nervous because apparently this pregnancy felt different, and I guess if she had 12 others, she'd really know. She said that she felt like the baby that was inside her was the devil. When she was ready to deliver her little newborn, instead of a happy little baby, the Jersey Devil was born, flew out into the night, and then spent the next 250 years terrorizing the New Jersey swampland. The creature is deeply rooted in local folklore, and to be honest, it's kind of beloved around Jersey. It serves as the name for the New Jersey Devils, and it worms its way into all sorts of pop culture games, movies, TV, music, they love them over there. For years, there have been stories and sightings around New Jersey, describing a kangaroo-like creature with glowing red eyes, hunting on small animals in the surrounding areas, and lots of blurry photos of bizarre hybrid-looking creatures running around the countryside. There have even been hunts and bounties posted for the Jersey Devil with rewards for its capture. So is the Jersey Devil real, or just a beloved local legend? Number one, the Hat Man. Rounding off our list is our most recent cryptid on this list, and a piece 
piece of modern folklore that is already making a lasting legacy. The Hat Man is a shadow person, or at least thought to be. Everyone who's seen the Hat Man has described almost the same thing exactly, most concerningly. A spindly, shadowy figure that appears to be wearing a hat. Sometimes a fedora, sometimes a top hat, but everyone describes him as wearing an old, out of date style, so you're not going to see him in a shadowy snapback anytime soon. He always appears fairly towering, and you can't see his face. It's obscured, or just not present. And the only thing you're truly able to make out are his pinprick red eyes poking out of the shadows watching you. Depending on who you ask based on the sightings, the hat man can be considered somewhat benign. Maybe. It's usually reported that the Hat Man appears to people who are suffering from sleep paralysis or insomnia. And most claims of Hat Man describe him as just watching, observing, studying, or whatever. I honestly don't know if that's better than it attacking you. However, it's not all just stories of nighttime stalking. There are some who claim that when they've been visited by the Hat Man, that he's jumped them or choked them, or they've felt burning sensations on their scalps or their chest. Although some say he's just watching you for I don't want to know why. There are many who believe that he feeds off your negative emotions, and perhaps this is how he satiates himself. It's said that people who are visited by Hat Man are those who are already struggling with something emotionally resonating. Sometimes people in the same family even report seeing the Hat Man in similar recurrences, so does he target specific groups of people? Or is it just certain emotions he hungers for? The Hat Man is shrouded in mystery, and even just thinking about him is enough to make my hair stand on end and start eyeing the coat rack in my room just a little suspiciously when I turn the lights off. Number 5. Menangle Starting off of our list of horrifying cryptids that would have the devil chucking underneath his bed is the Menangle, a demonic vampire spirit of the Philippines. Now, there is a good chance that I am horribly mispronouncing that name. My tagalog ain't quite what it used to be. Just being a big vampire creature would be enough to earn a spot on this list, but the Menangle doesn't settle for just the bare minimum. Oh, no, no, no. This creep turns it up all the way. Listen to me describe this monster and tell me that it wouldn't be out of place in Elden Ring attacking you in the horrible wastes of Kaelid. The Menangle is a humanoid bat creature hybrid. And a quick aside, while I was doing some research for this video, I found it really interesting that nearly every culture has their own variation of a humanoid bat cryptid. There's the Ahul in Indonesia, Kongamato in some African regions, and Bruce Wayne in North America. The Menangle has giant leathery bat wings, which it uses to sweep through the night, grabbing its prey and fleeing off. And we haven't even started talking about the Menangle's namesake and action feature. Its name comes from the Tagalog word tangle, which means to separate, with its full name roughly translating to one who separates itself. Well, whatever does that mean? Well, it's because this nightmare creature can split itself in half, taking to the skies as a disembodied torso with flapping bat wings screeching around. Can you even imagine how soul-stoppingly scary it would be to see a giant bat monster flying around with like its entrails just hanging? hanging out for everybody to see, hanging loose like an old man in a gym shower. Its favorite prey is couples, young newlyweds in love, and also people who are sleeping. No respect from this thing. You shouldn't attack sleeping lovers. If you're hearing this and you're locking your doors, a menangle is said to be thwarted by garlic. Now garlic will thwart it, but not slay it. I'm just glad I eat so much garlic and I'm very repugnant and I'm going to be alone for the rest of my life so I have no danger of menangles. Now, if you want loads more cryptic content, we have got enough to fill up a a zoo worth of the creepiest critters ever to crawl through the woods. Not your jam? We got aliens, monsters, movies, true crime, fake crime, and a lot of videos about a big shark. There's a little something to scare everybody. So hit that bell, stay subscribed, and stay scared. And please stay watching this video. I worked hard finding all these cryptids for you. Number four, Jordagumo. One of you delightful little ghouls in a previous video left a comment suggesting this one for me. And I thank you so much for putting me on the trail of this cryptid. I wouldn't have heard about it before. So shout out to the Phantom Spectator for this one. One. The Jorogumo is a monster of Japanese folklore that's kind of like a succubus, but with a bit more of an arachnid twist. I can't say the name of what Jorogumo translates to and stay within YouTube guidelines, but just know that it is extremely funny. I will give you a hint. Oldest profession spider. Ask your parents. Jorogumo is considered a yokai, basically a Japanese demon. It's a powerful shapeshifter, maintaining the form of a beautiful young woman to seduce its prey and able to transform into a vicious spider to finish the job off. What's she like to eat? Well, she has more uh, acquired tastes than flies.
flies and grasshoppers. The Jorogumo likes young, handsome men who are lonely and looking for love. When in her humanoid form, she'll seduce them, invite them back to her lair, and well, you can probably guess how it goes. The folklore behind Jorogumo is fascinating. In Edo period Japan, spiders were considered to be mythical creatures with alien abilities, which, I mean, come on, totally reasonable. And it was said that the older a spider gets, the more powerful and potent its abilities would become, kind of like a wizard. A Jorogumo is a spider that's lived for hundreds of years to be able to shapeshift, and she doesn't even look a day over 25. Not bad. An old folk tale tells the story of a woodcutter who fell in love with a woman he met at a waterfall. He visited her every day, but grew weaker with each visit. A priest accompanied him one day, and when a spider thread reached out to the woodcutter, the priest yelled, warning the woodcutter that the woman he loved was a dreaded Jorogumo. Already ensnared by her spell, he persisted and ran towards the waterfall, where he was entangled in the web and never seen again. Number three, the Beast of Exmoor. Whoa, with a name like the Beast of Exmoor, this thing's gotta be good, right? The Beast of Exmoor sounds like something you and a party of adventurers would set out to slay to restore peace and balance to Eternia. So what is the mighty Beast of Exmoor? Well, it's in Exmoor in the UK, which is a real place and not a fantasy castle, where it gets its name, and locals tell the story of a gigantic, elusive cat. In the 80s, there were all sorts of stories and sightings of a massive cat being described as similar to a puma or a panther being spotted around the Exmoor area. A farmer around the area claimed that he had lost over a hundred sheep in his care, and all of them lost in strange, unnervingly violent ways. Injuries that looked like a feral creature had mauled them. Skin peeled back, skulls crushed, throats cut. This grew the notoriety of the elusive creature, and where are these sightings come from? People would claim that they'd see this huge beast like a black leopard stalking the plains. In fact, it was theorized for a while that it was possible that the beast of Exmoor was a cougar or another big cat that had been owned by some sort of exotic collector, not naming any particular reality TV big cat owners, that had either gotten loose or let out into the wild to roam free, wreaking absolute havoc on an otherwise sleepy countryside. The problem got so bad that the Daily Express, which admittedly is a gossip rag, offered a cash reward for anyone who could bring the body of the Beast of Exmoor. Unfortunately, Geralt of Rivia was preoccupied, so no one was able to take this deal up. In 2006, a Devon farmer noticed the bones of a puma on his estate, which is odd, as there are very few pumas roaming the British countryside. There's cougars, yes, there's a lot of cougars in Great Britain and the UK, but I wouldn't consider Catherine Zeta-Jones a threat. So was the bones found the remnants of the Beast of Exmoor, or does this elusive cryptid still stalk the night, attacking sheep? The frustrating thing about hunting a cat cryptid is there's no way it's gonna come when you call it. Best thing you can do is put out a big cardboard box and hope that it'll jump inside that, because it's a cat. And number one, the hat man. Now, a lot of these entries and stories and cryptids have been told for generations over and over, so I think it's only fitting that I get with the times a little bit and we start talking about a modern cryptid. The hat man is the most recently talked about cryptid on this list, if you can call it that. Is cryptid the right word for a shadow person? I don't know, but it's my list, and if anyone wants to correct me, the hat man is welcome to come down to the studio. Interestingly, almost everyone who reports seeing this mysterious hat man describes it almost exactly the same way. A spindly, tall, shadowy figure that is wearing a hat, hence the name. Some people see a top hat, some see an old, like, newsman's fedora. Everyone says his attire is out of date by a century or two, so no new era fitted on this guy. You can't see his face at all, just shadows, and the only thing you can make out are his dead pinprick eyes, shining red in contrast to the darkness of the rest of his physique, and he is watching you. Now what does the hat man do besides checking in on you at night? People who report seeing him appear to be people who are suffering from sleep paralysis or insomnia, and most sightings of reports describe him as being benign if not terrifying. Watching you, studying you, what have you. There are some, however, who claim that he's not just a visitor and he's a little more sinister than that. Some people tell stories of getting an appearance from the hat man and feeling choked or burning sensations on their scalps or chest or just feeling like a general overwhelming terror and nausea, which I think is totally reasonable if there was a shadow demon in the corner of my room watching me. Now, some people who've seen him claim that he feeds off your emotions, and that the people who are visited by the hat man are those who are already struggling with something, like great stress or mental illness, which is probably definitely not made better by a shadow demon. Sometimes people in the same family claim that they can see him. So what's he doing? Is he targeting specific people, or is it certain emotions that he hungries about? Thinking about him 
already is enough to make my hair stand on end and squint at the coat rack in my room when I turn the lights off. I think I'm gonna sleep with just the, the lights on tonight, just, just to like be safe and make sure my cats don't bump into anything or, or anything. Number four, the Rougarou. Oh, that is so fun to say. Tr say that at home with me around. Rougarou. Oh, rolls off the tongue. Our next entry takes us deep into the swamps of Louisiana. Deep beneath the brush of the bayou, amidst all the flies, crawfish, toads, and gators, lies something sinister in the sunshiny Pelican State. All right, I'll knock that off. I won't do that for the rest of the video. I won't torture you. The Rougarou is a centuries-old cryptid, a more Cajun answer to the werewolf. The name Rougarou actually is a direct link from the French word for werewolf, Lugarou, shifting over time. If you L to an R, if you can hear it there, I don't know. My, my accent's not great. The history of the Rougarou can vary greatly, with differing legends and conflicting fables telling different stories of the beast's origins or motives, but it can all be traced all the way back to medieval France. Back in those days, a lot could go wrong. Lost crops, your livestock goes missing, your children go missing, your house burns down, all your investments in cryptocurrency go up in smoke and all your apes get stolen, any number of terrible things could happen to a French medieval peasant. And when that would happen, instead of cursing out or lashing out at the sky, you would blame the Rougarou for your troubles. It's very easy to pin all your problems on an imaginary werewolf. I do that all the time. I stub my toe, I curse out a werewolf. Villages would capture people who they believed to be acting strangely or even sometimes just somebody who lived out in the woods and pin all the blame on the village's problems on them for being a werewolf. So unfair the discrimination werewolves receive. This tradition of blaming an invisible werewolf for your problems led to the Rougarou becoming a fixture in legends passed down from French Catholics mostly about behaving. Stories would be told of how if you didn't behave, you didn't follow your parents' rules, the Rougarou would come and he'd snatch you from your bed in the middle of the night and carry you off in the woods. Or Sometimes he's like a very Catholic monster. If you didn't adhere to the rules of Lent every year, your sinful ways would see you transforming into a Rougarou. So it's, it's a, a Catholic werewolf born out of naughty behavior instead of being bit by one. How exactly someone like transforms into a Rougarou is not made super clear. Like if it only happens on full moons or if it's a one and done kind of thing and then you're a furry for life. All that's known is that the Rougarou is a deadly creature of the night. Stalking the swamps, giving pause to travelers who dare explore the bayou late at night. But hey, so long as you mind your P's and Q's and you promise to give up whatever you said you would for Lent, you and the Rougarou should be headed in different directions. Hopefully. Number three, Skinwalkers. This one is a very popular cryptid online, and you've probably heard a great deal about them before if you're a fan of this kind of thing. But the term does kind of get thrown around a lot and ends up describing all sorts of things that might not be super accurate. So let's take a look at examining some of the history of the legend and where it stems from. Skinwalkers are apparently like really viral on TikTok. I wouldn't know, I gotta be honest, I'd try to really limit how much time I'm on that. The Skinwalker is a creature of Navajo legend where it's referred to as a Yi Naldushi, and please forgive me if that's pronounced incorrectly. It translates to, by means of it, it goes on all fours, referring to their tendency to walk like an animal. Navajo witches and skinwalkers go against traditional Navajo values and are seen as the antithesis of their core beliefs. As well, it's worth adding, legends of skinwalkers and Navajo witches are not particularly well known or well told outside of indigenous communities, and some indigenous advocates and groups are not the biggest fan of their folklore and cultural history being made into fodder for ghost stories. Animals commonly associated with skinwalkers are coyotes, wolves, foxes, eagles, owls, or crows, but skinwalkers are said to be able to have the power to assume the form of any animal they see fit. Now, a variation of the legend surrounding the creature is that they're able to extend this ability to taking the face of a human victim, which is extremely scary. Some legends say that skinwalkers gain power from a victim's fear and that they prey on those who are afraid. And some state that looking into the eyes of one will cause your body to seize up, overtaken by the fear, where it will then attack you. On TikTok, as I've come to understand from some very intensive research and definitely not just goofing off at my desk watching TikToks of cats falling down on my phone, is that skinwalkers are popularly thought to be a creature imitating humans or animals and doing a poor job of it. Which case, if that is true, the likelihood of me being a skinwalker? 
sky high. Number two, Mongolian deathworm. Our next entry is a cryptid whose name really says it all. If you ever hear something get described as a Mongolian deathworm, you have to figure that is probably not the friendliest form of life out there. For starters, it sounds like it would be way more at home in the dunes of Arrakis than it would be on our Earth. That one's for my Frank Herbert heads out there. The creature is also called Ogoi Korkoi, which translates to large intestine worm, which is, ah, that's just lovely. Appetizing. It allegedly lives in the Gobi Desert, has been evading hunters since the 20s when it first rose to prominence. A paleontologist and author going by the name of Roy Chapman Andrew recounted a story he'd heard at a gathering with several Mongolian officials, where they all talked of the worm at great length. Now, no one among them could claim to have actually seen it, but everyone firmly believed in its existence. In this book, he describes the worm as being about two feet long, with no head or limbs to speak of, and has such poisonous skin that direct contact is enough to have you buying the farm. It's described as well as having a sprayable venom and an electric discharge. You should probably see a doctor for that. It burrows underground, only coming up to the surface to hunt and eat, presumably. In 1990, Czechoslovakian cryptozoologist and wow, that's a mouthful, Ivan Mackerel led a team to try and find the creature in the Gobi Desert. This I love so much because Dune is my favorite book. They use the same technique that the Fremen of Arrakis use to try and find these worms that the Fremen used to deal with the sandworms. They used the rhythmic thumping made from a motor-driven thumper to try and summon the creature out of possible hiding spots. They never found the fabled worm, and that's because they weren't taking spice, so they couldn't see properly. So either it was just a dream, or the thing is very, very good at hiding. And I think <laughs> with a little work, that could make a fun expression. Like, oh, it's as hard as trying to find a worm in a desert. We'll workshop it. Number one, Gashidokuro. And our final entry is gonna come from Japan. And as a fabled mythological creature, and may I just say, is one of my favorite mythical monsters I've read about in a while. As soon as I was reading about this thing, I started texting my friends, I was so excited about it. This thing is a real life Dark Souls boss fight. Maybe I'm outing myself as way too much of a nerd here, but this thing is where the inspiration for High Lord Walnir and Grave Lord Nito of Dark Souls fame came from. I couldn't resist throwing it out there, sorry guys. Formed from tens of thousands of bones of fallen soldiers, the Gashidokuro is a massive titan of a beast, a gigantic skyscraper-sized skeleton. Is that not the coolest thing you've ever heard? A giant which wanders around the countryside during the darkest hours of the night. Their teeth chatter and their bones rattle, which is why the translation for their name translates loosely to rattling skull. You'd have to imagine though, you would probably hear this thing chattering its teeth from a few hundred miles away. You'd hear it in the next town over. It's said that the Gashidokuro is born when mass amounts of soldiers die on the same battlefield. Their bodies rot in the fields and they don't receive proper funerary rites. As such, their souls are filled with torment as their bodies lay face down in the muck and that malice permeates their bones, causing them to twist and mend into unnatural ways, clumping together to eventually form the humongous skeletal monster of a boss fight, the Gashidokuro. Now, troublesome for humans. It's said that a Gashidokuro is too large and too powerful to be felled by ordinary weapons. Although, I have to wonder if that's still true. I feel like we put more gunpowder in things in 2023 than they did in the Sengoku period, and I'm pretty sure a bulldozer would make short work of a bunch of bones being held together with hatred. It's said that these creatures no longer show up because the amount of dead bodies in one place are not nearly as high as they once were in rural areas of Japan back then, with significantly less wars and plagues occurring, which is a a sign of progress, right? You know, if there's so few piles of mass graves that they're no longer reanimating as Godzilla-sized skeleton demons, that, that's a real positive note for the human race and I think something we can all smile about. When it comes to all things cryptid behavior, more often than not, I struggle to narrow down who I want to talk about in a day. Like, sure, it would be easy to just go with the most mainstream guys like Bigfoot, Nessie, I'm looking at you, but I like to change things up, keep them interesting challenge myself. So, question for you, who do you think is the creepiest cryptid out there? Let me know in the comments and let's dive into some that freak me out. So how about we start off today with something that's guaranteed to make me go, Ugh. a large insectoid something something spotted in Oregon. So back in the early 2000s, a man by the name of Adam Brittle was out for a bike ride at around 4.45 in the morning near the Willamette River in Eugene, Oregon. The spot he chose to stop and rest at was next to the famous Owen Rose Garden Park and Interstate 5 ran overhead. So he was underneath next to the river, he put his back against one of the support beams from the highway and was just chilling. But that's when he noticed some strange things going on across the river from where he was, which he estimates was maybe 50 feet on the bank. He saw two tall, thin but very muscular, mantis insect beings on the other bank. 
Yucky. The first one was less than 10 feet from the water's edge, not moving at all, but its eyes were open and glassy like mirrors. And there was a person there, on the ground, face down and looking like maybe he fell. And that's when Adam noticed the second hellion. Now, you might be asking yourself, how or why didn't Adam notice the second creature before that point? It's because this thing wasn't super clear to his eyes since it was jerking backwards and forwards so quickly over another body that seemed to move like a blur, which that, that that's very fast. So at this point, obviously Adam was a little terrified. Like, yes, that should be obvious, but I wanted to make sure I was crystal clear. He slid forward from his pole, attempting to quietly move away, but looked back up against his will, and that's when he heard strange talking and when sounding like the banging of metal on concrete. He was met with the view of what looked like a white, bald man with big black sunglasses peering out from behind the pillar barely 15 feet away from him. Adam made eye contact with whatever it was and scrambled to get out of there as quickly as he could. He stumbled a couple of times, never looking back as he hopped on his bike and began pedaling like his life depended on it. And hey, as far as we know, maybe it did. Right after he started riding, his stomach decided to start emptying itself from the stress of the entire situation. And that's when something flashed by Adam and it was so quick that it seemed like it was running at hyper speed. He decided to go to the hospital to be safe and outside the window of the Emerge waiting area, he observed a black car doing laps around the building for a solid hour, as if it was waiting for something or somebody. And the windows were fogged, so all he could make out were the outline of three bodies, which only added to his fear until they left. And he's just sitting there like, I need help, but at the same time, I'm feeling scared. A couple of days after the whole debacle, Adam was feeling brave and went back to the scene of the unknown to try and figure things out. He noticed a lack of any kind of track marks or footsteps where the unknown creatures had been, but it almost looked like the area had been dug up up and resettled, which creepy. Now apparently he hasn't seen the creatures ever since, but like, who knows? Time to venture over to Motory Bay for the tale of Bobo. Will you indulge me and allow me to tell this like the incredible story it is? Thank you kindly. It was a clear fall day, and the Pacific Ocean was as flat and clear as a giant mirror. From Captain Sal Coletto's small salmon fishing boat, 10 miles off Moss Landing, the indentation of Motory Bay on the shore looked like a giant thumbprint as he headed back towards Point Pinos. After a day of luckless fishing in the waters of Santa Cruz, the Monterey fisherman was looking forward to getting home. Suddenly, Coletto noticed something floating in the sea about a half mile farther out. Thinking it might be a man bobbing in the ocean, he revved the engine and headed out towards the object. When the captain got within 100 feet of the thing, he saw a creature with a head the size of a 50 gallon barrel. It was tapered to where a duck-like bill protruded from the massive bulging forehead. Coletto started to think about how a pair of fishermen had disappeared recently without a trace. Maybe the sea monster had devoured them. Not wanting to join their ranks, he pushed his boat's throttle all the way down and headed back towards the Monterey Peninsula. He decided that he wasn't going to tell anybody about what he'd seen. He was like, no, I don't feel like being labeled crazy zip. 16 years later though, Coletta was traveling towards the fishing grounds off of Half Moon Bay on his 45 foot boat, the Dante Alighieri. And while the crew ate lunch in the galley below, Coletto and his brother-in-law swapped fishing stories as the craft headed northwards. Eventually, his brother-in-law started talking about a strange sea creature that he'd spotted a few times at the edge of the deep Monterey submarine canyon. Coletto got the chills as his brother-in-law described how other fishermen had said the beast would only surface on calm, sunny days. About 24 hours before a strong northwest wind would start to blow. And this was a windless day, and the water was smooth and silver as liquid mercury. As Coletto gazed towards the Santa Cruz Mountains, he observed something bobbing in the sea, and his heart fluttered like a dying fish's gills. He realized immediately that it was that strange creature once again. He yelled out to the crew, all hands on deck. They poured out of the galley and stood on the bow of the boat, wondering what the commotion was all about. I want all of you guys to see this, he said, as he slowly brought the boat closer to the beast. The captain then cut the motor, and the boat drifted within 50 feet of the object. The creature's eyes were closed, and it floated on the surface as if it was sunbathing or sleeping. It has the face of a monkey, his cook squealed. Eh, let's sleep. This is a bad omen. His brother-in-law was like, oh no, that looks like the face of an old man. Now the noise must have awakened the monster, and it slowly opened its eyes, which were as big and pink as grapefruits. The creature's body was brown and almost as long as a boat. Its skin was wrinkled and sagged from its frame like ill-fitting clothing. Coletto thought to himself that this was a very old animal. And while the crew argued about what it looked like, the monster quietly slid underwater. Following the sighting, several other fishermen saw the creature, and eventually the people of the area started to refer to the animal as Bobo, the old man of the sea. So from then on, Coletto kept a camera on his vessel, hoping to once again spot Bobo and get photographic evidence of its existence. Sadly, he never saw it again. But a few years later, in 1925, a strange sea creature washed ashore on a beach about two miles north of Santa Cruz. Though the body was decomposed, scientists including the notable E.L. Wallace, a former president of the Natural History Society of British Columbia, didn't think that this was the carcass of a whale or a shark. He's like, this might be a plesiosaurus, a large marine reptile held over from the Jurassic period, but he couldn't tell you for sure. And here's the thing, reportings of this creature continue to this day. To this day. Yeah, that's 
creepy enough. No thank you. Oh, we're not done with unknown sea cryptids yet, folks. We're just moving 26 miles over to Capitola. A captain who prefers to stay anonymous was driving a team towards the area, when suddenly his attention was captured by some young sea lions not far out. They were lined up, and several large lions were swimming back and forth in front of them. Much farther out, he saw the water being churned to foam and then thrown high up in the air. It was shiny, and at first he was like, okay, it's just a big fish, whatever. A dozen or more so lions were battling it, and every once in a while, all would rise out of the water. So it was looking to him as though all the sea lions were attacking it beneath, and then the monster came out of the water several times. Afterwards, when he was telling the story, he's like, I think it's about 30 feet long. So a few days later, the body of a strange creature was discovered by Charles Moore on the shore in that very same area that our witness saw the battle. The body was examined by none other than E.L. Wallace. You know that expert I just talked about? Pretty great. And he's like, my examination of the monster was quite thorough. I felt in its mouth and found it had no teeth. Its head is large and its neck fully 20 feet long. The body is weak and the tail is only three feet in length from the end of the backbone. These facts do away with the whale theory, as the backbone of a whale is far larger than any bone in this animal. And once again, its tail is too weak for an animal of the deep and does away with that last version. And with a bill like this, it must have lived on herbage. So later he offered the theory that the monster might have been preserved in a glacier for millions of years, finally being released by the gradual melting of ice and eventually ending up in the area. But to this day, nobody knows exactly what that thing was. Just that there tends to be a lot of aquatic cryptid activity all in the same area. Time to move out of this bay and venture over to the Bridgewater Triangle. It is one of the most haunted areas in Massachusetts, heck, just a notable spooky spot in the overall United States. Matt Danchuk and his buddies decided one night, around 3 a.m. in the morning, that it would be a fun idea to go exploring the Profile Rock area, just for laughs. Look. I know we can all see where this is going, but I'm gonna tell the story anyways. If you can't see, well, 3 a.m. sounds like a good time to go exploring, folks. So guys were on their way out, they were walking down a long winding path to get back to their vehicle, they'd done their exploring, but that's when stuff began to happen. So let's set the scene for everybody. It's pitch black out, the only thing the guys could see was the moon shining through the trees, and Matt felt the need to turn around while they were walking. Not sure why, but something caught his eye. He spotted some sort of creature, limply running towards the group, it was about 100 feet away, favoring one leg over the other. Now initially he thought it was somebody who got injured in the woods or something, until he saw this thing run past the moonlight. So you know how when somebody draws a person as like a stick figure, like that? Apparently that's exactly how this thing looked. It had no facial features, no face, just a completely blank like stick figure. Its body looked the same from what Matt could see, no definition or anything. Now Matt nudged his buddy to turn around as well. When he saw the look of horror go across his friend's face, they made eye contact and just ran until they reached their vehicle. They never saw the creature again. Number five, Snow Wasset. Coming up first on our list of icy cold little critters is the Snow Wasset, a fearsome legless little cryptid and a local one to boot, so I had to include it. Anything that comes from the greater Canada area is a big deal for me. It went Enters by the Great Lakes in the Hudson Bay, and in the rest of the year crawls up to Newfoundland and Labrador. Totally the wrong time of year, buddy. You gotta go to Newfoundland in the winter for Jig's dinner. Anyway, a snow wasset is like a weasel. It's a long, furry creature, except it has no legs. Except in the summertime, where it does have legs and also turns green. If I was a biologist, I would love to get my hands on this thing and figure that out. That particular part of the lore of this creature is really fascinating to me. Why, why would a creature shed its legs like baby teeth? What cruel joke of evolution is that? It's like a mammal sandworm. Anyway, Anyway, I gotta move on. When it's in its legless, winterized form, it burrows deep beneath the snow and ambushes its prey by surprise and drags them into the frozen underground. Absolutely horrifying. A frozen, legless, furry little snake is not pleasant by any definition. A wasset is said to be four times as large as a wolverine and 40 times as hungry, requiring a vast amount of meat to keep it sustained. Doesn't shed enough calories shedding those legs. I'm sorry, I, I, I don't know why I'm so hung up about this, my ghouls, but I am. It, maybe it's because there's not actually that much information about the snow wasset out there. Sightings and stories about it date back mostly hundreds of years, and there haven't been too much buzz about them ever since. Perhaps they're extinct. Or perhaps they've all just burrowed under too deep where I can't see them. Either way, the only thing that really stood out for me is they turn green and have no legs, so I'm gonna keep banging on on that. And hey, when it's this cold outside, what do you really need to go out for? Stay inside, order some food, turn the heat up, and keep watching Top 5 Scary for the rest of the night. And while you're there, maybe think about tossing a subscribe your way if it's not too much trouble. Number four, the Nuklavi. Coming up next on this list is the Nuklavi, a cryptid that I had never heard of before researching for this video. So I hope it's new to you too, and you get to learn something cool. The Nuklavi is an old Nordic myth, a demon of the sea, appearing as a horrifying demonic part horse, part man, part thing hybrid. Seriously, this thing is disgusting. It looks like somebody glued a bunch of leftover horse parts and man parts together, and it's completely skinless, leaving its exposed flesh to all the elements to see. Kind of looks like one of those behind the scenes video of how they make McDonald's chicken nuggets, you know? The Nuklavi 
flea is said to be trapped in the sea during the warmer months of the year, and then come winter is set free to wreak all kinds of havoc. This thing is pure evil, destroys just by breathing. The horsey head part emits toxic fumes just by opening its wretched maw, and this vapor causes crops to wilt, people to fall ill, and drought soon follows after. I see why they keep this thing locked up for most of the year, because it kind of sounds like a royal nuisance. It's thought that the Nuckle View was first created by old Nordic storytellers as a way of rationalizing and explaining away things like drought and plague destroying the harvest. It's much easier to put a face to your problems, and when that problem is a wretched flayed horseman, it's easy to get angry at that. When stories of the Nuckle View were told, it was thought to be so evil that its name was always said in a hushed whisper for fears of speaking too loudly of it could attract its attention. Oh, I wish I knew that about two minutes ago. I just said its name like 16 times very loudly. It said that if you were ever to encounter the dread to find the nearest fresh body of water. This sickly creature of the sea is deathly afraid of fresh water, I guess. You think a creature with all that skin exposed wouldn't like salt water or the cold, but hey, there you go, to each their own. You do you, terrifying skinless monster horseman. Number three, a Chenu. A Chenu is an Algonquin creature of folklore a bit similar to a Wendigo, but with some fun regional twists. While both creatures hunt in wooded northern areas and are both commonly associated with the wintertime, a Wendigo is usually depicted as a stretched out, emaciated monster whereas a Chenu is depicted as being massive, very furry, and only getting larger and larger the more it eats. Actually, reading that back now, I realize that's not terribly impressive. Most things get larger and larger as they eat. Much like a Wendigo, though, a Chenu is thought to have been formerly a man who was turned into a beast, either through their greedy ways, refusing to feed the starving, or for those who give in to the darkest of temptations and consume human flesh willingly. A Chenu is described as looking like a cross between an old man and a beast, large and imposing in appearance with big chunks of their own flesh missing, possibly self-inflicted. They cover themselves in the forest, hiding themselves with leaves, bark, snow, pine needles, until they look like a horrible lint roller of the woods that walks upright. Interestingly, unlike a Wendigo, it's thought that the process of turning into a Chenu can actually be reversed. There's some good news. In some folk tales, the way to cure a Chenu is a special medicine that can cause them to vomit up their frozen heart and vomit up the flesh that they've consumed, causing the afflicted to revert back to their human form in a sight that is no doubt disgusting for everybody. But if this isn't possible, if you don't have this medicine on hand, or it's just not feasible to trick a Chenu, you can also get it to eat salt, which will apparently melt it from the inside. Poor, poor Chenu. You're forced to live a tormented existence as a snow monster, isolated from your former friends, doomed to hunt on your former species, consuming only the darkest meat available, and you can't even order a little bit of salt for your dinner, eating a totally flavorless diet. I got nothing but sympathy for you, Chenu. Number three, Kamataichi. I think it's really, really fascinating what each culture's cryptids look like, you know? Each culture creates cryptids and they all put their fun little spins on it. And whenever I get to make these videos, I learn all sorts of really cool mythological stuff that I'd never heard of before. And I sincerely hope you get that out of these videos too. I never heard of this next one, the Kamataichi, but I am obsessed with it now. Coming to us from Japan, this yokai, which is like a Japanese type of demon, appears like a weasel except with razor sharp sickle like claws, like a real life Sneasel from Pokemon. I'm actually amazed there's no Pokemon directly based on a Kamataichi. They seem like perfect for it. They have spiny fur, similar to a hedgehog, like prickly little needles, but they bark like a dog and their claws could not be any sharper and they're sickle shaped. And also a lot of depictions of them are downright adorable. These funny little creatures are extremely lightweight and have learned how to ride the currents of the wind to travel. They honestly sound kind of like radical in like a California surfer way. The legends of the Kamataichi come out of the Chubu region of Japan when vicious cold winds were so powerful they would cut people down directly. And these legends would take the form of the spirit called the Kamataichi, which was the winds themselves as this furry little miscreant. It would attack at your legs, causing you to fall down, exposed and helpless while it sucked at your blood. It's said that no blood occurs from their woundings because of this, as a Kamataichi moves so quickly and sucks it all up. That's almost considerate of it, doesn't leave a stain. These creatures move so quickly and they're so good at hiding that they're apparently completely invisible to the naked eye, appearing as nothing more than a sharp, freezing wind on your skin. Amusingly, there's some debate as to whether or not a Kamataichi's true origin is actually nothing more than a silly pun. There's a stance a samurai would use called a kamatachi, translating loosely to sword stance, which would explain, you know, it's a sharp thing 
It, I don't know where the stance comes in, but it's sharp. However, there are legends all throughout Japan, throughout many, many regions, all telling stories of creatures that ride the wind and attack humans, and the sickle weasel remains among the most popular and among the most adorable. Sorry, Kamataichi, you are just so cute. If anybody knows where to get like a stuffed toy of this little guy, please comment under the video. I need to know. Number three, more Bigfoot. So now we travel over to southeast Oklahoma with a tale from Susan Paulson. It was just another day and she was checking on the animals when the weather radio blared out a tornado warning. So at the time there was a large storm over the area and an advisory was indeed in effect. So while she wasn't surprised, Susan quickly closed up the barn door and hurried towards the house, finding her offspring and husband. They got themselves into a shelter, barred the metal door and sat waiting for the worst. About five minutes after they settled into the dugout, the wind started picking up outside and the whole family could hear thunder and rain outside of the doors. It was soon joined by the impacts of large hail hitting the metal door as the sound of the wind changed to a roar, similar to a plane about to take off. They could hear the different sounds of objects hitting the door, but particularly a loud crack and lots of scraping on the door. In total, the entire event lasted maybe seven minutes, but the family didn't try to leave the dugout until the wind died down, which, you know, it makes sense. Susan's husband unbarred the door and tried opening it, but it would only open about an inch. They could see through the crack that the apple tree next to the dugout had blown over in front of the door. And uh, heck, they tried to pry the door open every every which way, slamming their bodies against the door, but nothing worked. The family was completely stuck in the shelter, but they knew at some point there would be people checking on places in the tornado's path, so they stuck a piece of wood in the crack of the door to hold it open and got comfortable and prepared to wait. When 7 p.m. rolled around, they discovered that claustrophobia and panic attacks can strike anyone, no matter how prepared you are. So technically the family was safe and prepared physically for a week, but Susan's not sure their minds could have lasted a week. They could see it was dark through the crack of the door when a foul odor wafted in, smelling like a wet dog combined with a male goat and a teenager's armpits. Now Susan originally thought it was an overly pungent skunk and she went to shut the door, but stopped when she heard what sounded like footsteps. The family started yelling for help, calling out to whoever was out there, but nobody responded. There was a shuffling sound and the smell got even stronger, causing Susan's eyes to water as she yelled out and pounded on the door. She heard a grunt before the sound of footsteps and the odor started fading away. Eventually the footsteps returned and while everyone trapped, you know, yelled and pounded on the door, once again there was no response and the footsteps left once more. This time Susan felt uneasy and barred the door shut. Something just wasn't right with this person. At around 3 in the morning, are we sensing a pattern? Susan's daughter woke up from a nightmare and started crying, and Susan was comforting her when she heard branches cracking and scraping against the door along with grunting. She woke her husband up, and once again, they pounded on the door and yelled, this time leaving the door open as much as possible. You know, just couple of inches, man. When the noises outside stopped, they waited about 10 minutes to try to open the door, and this time it opened, enough for the family to be able to step out. The trunk of the tree was lying near the door, but there was a pile of branches off to the side. And in that ground outside, there were a lot of footprints bigger than any foot Susan had ever seen. After tucking the offspring in their proper beds, Susan headed out to the barn to see if the animals were okay. It was about halfway there when she heard one of their hogs screaming. She ran towards the barn, and a few yards away, she could see her market-ready Hampshire barrow struggling and screaming while slung over over the shoulder of a dark, hulking, human-like figure. Susan yelled at the figure to drop her peg, and it just turned and stared. She shined her flashlight at the creature's face, revealing a grayish face with a flat-looking nose. It was covered with thin, dark brown hair all over its body and massive feet. After a few seconds, it turned and walked into the cornfield towards the creek and disappeared from view. Yay for saving everyone, but bummer about losing the livestock. Number two, a glimmer man in Chicago. So Stella's experience took place on September 2nd of 2022 after a day of running errands for her elderly father when she returned to his apartment building and sixth floor residence. She went out onto the balcony for, you know, smoke break, just uh, standing and allowing her mind to go blank when she noticed a weird large tree about 20 feet away. Yeah, yeah, I'll elaborate. So one of the branches on the tree was bowing quite heavily, but Stella couldn't see anything on it that could be responsible for the weighing down. As she was staring at the branch and trying to make sense of what her eyes were seeing, an intense feeling of dread and fear came over her, as if every part of her body was screaming at her to turn around and run, but she didn't know why. At this very moment, the bowing branch that she had just been observing began to shake violently, and despite her internal instincts still screaming at Stella to leave, curiosity had now gotten the better of her, and she started to move along the railing to get a closer look. As your friendly narrator, this is where I interject and tell anyone with some sense to run, but hey, what do I know? A small form began to glimmer on the branch, and as Stella continued to watch in shock, a transparent human figure that shimmered a yellowish white color developed. She snapped out of her fixated stare and quickly took a step back from the railing, realizing finally that uh, this is something that should be feared. Glad the old common sense kicked in after the overwhelming fear, dread, and visual, you know, should have kicked in sooner in my opinion, but that's just my usual snark kicking in. The shimmery being eventually dropped out of the tree, landing behind a man who happened to be walking past at the time. The walking man spun around, his reaction similar to, you know, as if he had been 
been hit with an object from behind and was confused when all he saw was a cloud of smoke. The shimmery man had disappeared in said puff of smoke almost instantly after hitting the ground. Stella waited for some time, expecting to see this thing reemerge, you know, but it was completely gone. At the same time, another neighbor just a few floors below Stella and her dad had also observed exactly the same thing as her and uh, managed to confirm all the same details. The neighbor and Stella then managed to track down the man who was walking past a few hours later and after a conversation, confirms that he had felt the weird impact, the overwhelming dread, but didn't see anything. Stella is positive that the Glimmer Man still roams the area, often feeling the overwhelming emotions from the day whenever she visits her dad, but hasn't spotted it since. My heart goes out to her, and I hope whatever it is buggers off soon. Number one, not dear. I gotta say, I was definitely chuckling a bit at first when I was reading about the scripted, but you know, seeing as where I'm from, that's just another way to lead into conversation about seeing a moose on the highway. And while the thought of driving within eyesight of a moose is scary enough, not deer are actually scarier. So this report comes from Elias Merritt in Roanoke, Virginia. Describing the time of day as almost dark, he was waiting for a friend to meet him for dinner when he experienced a feeling of something or someone watching him. He turned around suddenly and saw what he described as the shadow of a man behind a bush, which caused him to flee to the other side of the street, hiding in an area where he felt safer but could still see, you know, if his friend was coming. As he stood in this new position, Elias saw two deer along the edge of the woods and watched them as they moved, observing that one of the deer seemed to have a bad back leg or was just injured. He walked in their direction to get a better look and see if he could help, but as he got closer, he realized uh, they weren't deer and froze, petrified. The beings had oddly shaped heads and appeared to have patches of hair stitched over human skin. Both of the creatures looked in the direction of Elias and slowly stood up on their back legs and began running towards him, chasing him to the point where he was simply running and yelling in the direction of who knows what, no longer worried about waiting for his friend. He eventually ran into Zed friend and in a panic told him the entire story. And what do you know? The friend turned pale and explained that several years prior, he had had a similar experience while hunting in the forest outside of town, with his descriptions of the creatures being almost identical to what Elias had seen. Not to sound like a broken record, but I'm really glad I've never been like the nature hiking type. Number five, the Jersey Devil. Since the 19th century, New Jersey citizens have been putting up with a devilish cryptid whose name describes him to a T, the Jersey Devil. The Jersey Devil is described as a kangaroo-like creature with the head of a dog, face of a horse, bat-like wings, horns on its head, and a tail. The Jersey Devil has been terrorizing people for hundreds of years, and there have been a multitude of reported sightings which helped create the creature's reputation. While visiting a mill to inspect his cannonballs being forged, Stephen Decatur launched a cannon at a flying animal overhead. The animal hardly flinched and continued on flying. People often complained of the devil eating their livestock and leaving the animals in ghastly states. One man was actually able to demobilize the creature, thinking it dead and took a picture. He showed it to dozens of people in the hope that someone would be able to identify the, the creature with red eyes, and many claimed that it resembled the Jersey Devil. In January of 1909, there was a drastic influx in published sightings. Newspapers wrote of the devil attacking trolley cars and social clubs. The authorities supposedly fired at the creature in an attempt to stop the attacks, but to no avail. Reports of footprints in the snow were coming in from all over the state. Many even offered thousands of dollars for the capture of the Jersey Devil, with the plans to make a private enclosure or zoo for the cryptid. Skeptics believe that the Jersey Devil is nothing more than a folk story, saying that the devil was created by the early settlers who were collectively suffering from mass hysteria. Many people have been found faking their claims of sighting the Jersey Devil, and even faking tracks or photographs in an effort to substantiate their claims. Whether the Jersey Devil is real or not, it has definitely become extremely well known and feared as a North American cryptid. When it comes to cryptids, I feel like we all have our favorite creature. I'm partial to Nessie and Mothman for sure, but I'll never complain about a day where I get to chat about Bigfoot as well. So what about you? Let me know yours in the comments and let's dive into today together. Alrighty everybody, so since I'm Canadian, how about we start off today with a report out of West Dalhousie, Nova Scotia. Back in 2010, a man named Andre Shields entered a contest with the province of Nova Scotia to win a chance to get a prize and a commercial for tourism on TV. The area he decided to go visit still had frozen snow and since it was the end of March apparently the hike was nice. From time to time Andre felt like somebody was watching him but he assumed it was like a coyote or something since it was an area that was heavily populated with wildlife. Oh by the way his brilliant idea was to show off the caves in the area for the contest which hey I'm not an expert but exploring caves alone sounds pretty dang dangerous to me. Andre has mentioned that at the time he had a fascination with caves and still does to this day and like once again I get it they're neat but like 
Safety first? So it was when he was filming the caves that Andre started hearing footsteps outside. The cave he was in was made up of split granite, incredibly squared off like a tomb with the features of a pyramid outside, as well as possibly Nova Scotia's only known stone animal figure, to the extent of his knowledge. I haven't really been able to find info to confirm or deny, so let me know in the comments if you know otherwise. After a few minutes, he realized the footsteps were bipedal. AKA somebody who can walk on two legs, so probably not a random coyote. Which by the way, props to him for not being terrified of those creatures, since the thought of seeing those in the wild would send me running. Around the same time, he started smelling something like dirty gym shoes, and apparently it was like really, really bad, and I don't even want to try to picture what that smells like, because I don't need to gag again on here. Been there, done that, not fun. Finally, a common sense kicked in for Andre, and he decided to try and get the heck out of there. He exited the cave and looked to the west and saw something standing behind a tree, and ergo decided to go the other way, and used a tree as a fireman's pole to slide down. Now at this point, I think he thought it might have been a bear, and speaking from experience, yikes dude, your safety is so not worth this video or contest. So he was tiptoeing back towards the trail when he turned around and saw something using fingers to peer through the branches at him. The silhouette was that of a very tall man and its hands had black nails, light brown hair, its eyes were very large and dark, and the face looked like a monkey man with pinkish brownish skin. His words, not mine. He started his camera back up and tried recording, and the creature wasn't moving while he was. And soon enough, his reaction of absolute fear was recorded when he started running. Eventually, he stopped at a large puddle to catch his breath and saw where something huge had stepped into a smaller tree and the moss, leaving a massive print and into the water, leaving another. So he took some pictures and kept going, realizing it had come from the same direction he was running towards. Well, he kept running, he noticed oddly bent trees, broken branches, and just got the heck out of there. He didn't dare venture into the woods again until like 2022. And gee. I wonder why. Next stop, we have a spotting from last August in Texas. So this all started with a bizarre daylight animal sighting. Tina Kalig was pretty stumped, so she reached for a camera. She's like, okay, let's get some pictures. I don't know what this is, but maybe somebody else will. But sadly, the photos didn't do much to clarify the critter's identity. Instead, they opened a Pandora's box of cryptid theories, which is where we come in. All Tina knows for sure is that the animal enjoyed chowing down on berries that had fallen from a bush in her hill country village backyard. In an interview, she later recalled, like, she was inside, she looked out into the yard and saw an animal and was like, Okay, what is it? The creature was a yellowish brown color and appeared to be almost the size of a large dog with a long tail that almost touched the ground and very large pricked ears. After getting the images, she uploaded them to next door. That's a little social media thing for a little local feedback. And her neighbors were like, I don't know either. And that's when all the different theories and possibilities started pouring in because it's the internet, everybody's got their two cents. They included everything from a coyote dog mix to the chupacabra. So I'm sure you can guess where my thoughts lie on the matter. Now, that name refers to a mythical reptile-like creature in parts of the Americas that is said to stand three to four feet high, hop like a kangaroo, and attack and drink the life source of livestock. Some folks also thought it might have been the legend of an area mountain lion that a lot of people have long sighted but never caught on camera. Now, this isn't the first time that the Texas parks and wildlife officials have proven stumped by something caught on camera. In April of last year, a wildlife camera in the Rio Grande Valley revealed a never before seen animal as well. But when it comes to the case of Tina's unknown species, a lot of folks who watched the video were like, we've got some guesses. They're like, okay, maybe it's a wolverine. It could be a bush dog, optical illusion. Maybe two wild hogs passing by one another? So Rachel Malstaff of the San Antonio Zoo weighed in, thinking that it might be a dog or a canine dealing with mange or other skin conditions. And hey, without better pictures, who knows? My theory? A chupacabra just wanting to enjoy some fresh berries and peas. The narrator of the video starts off by saying, I'm at a horse stable right now, as you can see. The other day I was walking over here, I saw a guy working the land. He works in the horse stable. Okay, we've got that. So our narrator's like, hey, anytime I see a guy working the land, I get curious. I got some questions. So he's like, okay, have you ever seen anything interesting out there? And oftentimes they'll be like, oh yeah, you know, I've seen some coyotes, as one does. But this is where, once again, Alexander Jacks, because I would love to know how people are so casual with talking about coyotes. Like, so, back to our narrator. He's like, okay. So as the conversation's warming up, he's like, hey, new guy. You ever seen anything out here you can't explain? And apparently the moment he said that, this new guy's eyes lit up. He was like, it's really weird you asked me that question. He's like, just last week, my buddy took the craziest video back in these woods. So he pulls up his buddy's private Facebook page. And well, it's a private Facebook page. And he's like, oh, I'm gonna send you this link. Which, if you've ever tried to send a link from a private page, not gonna happen. So apparently we had to pull up a video, one phone, another phone, screen record, all these things. We've got the video. I haven't seen anybody be able to explain what the heck is going on in it. So, 
What do you guys think? What's super weird about the video is the guy who took the video won't even go back into the woods anymore. And did you see the dog in the video? So that dog was growling and was looking over into the area where the apparition appears. And just like, it just what a crazy video. To quote the guy, I could, I just still, I can't believe it, and I haven't been able to figure out what's going on. I know we've been showing the TikTok since I've started talking, so like, what do you folks think? Hey look, having a dog going haywire adds to the validity for me. Animals are super perceptive of the weird and ooky spooky, and they're a good marker of just what the heck? Okie dokie everyone, we're gonna end today with a video that's close to home for me, a spawning of Bigfoot from Northern Ontario. Now it isn't specified where, but since the terrain looks pretty familiar to me, I'd be willing to bet on Northeastern Ontario to be specific. It shows what clearly appears to be a Sasquatch walking in a wooded area near a body of water. The video was shared by the Rocky Mountain Sasquatch Organization, and it was stated along with the video that these boaters in Northern Ontario had recently captured the incident. No specific time or location of the sighting was provided, but you know my guess. So the boulders were recording the nearby shoreline when a large biped with reddish brown hair stepped out from the woods and walked across the open shoreline, providing a clear, even though brief, view to the onlookers. It quickly disappears into the trees, but the fluid movement of the Sasquatch is noted, along with its deafness in navigating the rocky and steep terrain with ease. So because of the dexterity demonstrated in the video recording, I find it difficult to imagine that this was anything other than an actual Sasquatch, as opposed to a human dressed in a heavy and bulky suit. I've been a mascot a number of times, you don't move that fluidly. This isn't the only time I've spoken about Sasquatch type cryptids being spotted up north, so I genuinely think there's a whole slew of them enjoying the deep woods and slightly cooler climate up there. I vote we let them exist in peace.